Hey, this is H1. We're going to be running it back with another episode talking about chess knowledge, chess wisdom, and chess understanding. And today, we are going to be discussing a game uh, against white as Adolf Anderson and black as Jean Defresne. And apparently, this was in um, Berlin, and the date supposedly was 1852. So let's get through this game. And the title of the video is this game ends with an amazing checkmate and it really does too and let's just get into it right quick so this game starts off with one of my favorite openings the evans a gambit e4 e5 knight f3 knight c6 bishop c4 bishop c5 and then b4 that initiates the evan the evans gambit and then after bishop takes on b4 c3 bishop a5 then the move that is played next d4 and then jean decided to take the pawn on d4 which is reasonable and then after king side castle and yes that c3 pawn can be taken too but you run into some problems so some people like to deviate from the actual gambit by playing the move d3 to not give their opponent a lot of activity like they want and hey this is an alternative that is still played Till this day. So the main moves are still played. Queen b3 was played after this attacking the f7 pawn. So Jean decided, you know what? Let me just protect that pawn just in case you try to do something stupid on this f7 pawn. You know, the f7 pawn is one of the weakest pawns on the board, especially in the beginning of the game. Until you get castles where you have two pawns that is protecting that f pawn. But after queen f6, um, Adolf had this understanding of the opening and was like, no, I, I want to attack you, even though these pieces are developed and it's not exactly going to work yet, but I want to make sure that I got the upper hand and that I'm putting the initiative on you since I gambited a pawn. So he played e5. Yes, they can take twice, but you don't want to run into some tricky rookie one, right? And yes, if the knight takes the e5 pawn, it's probably better just to play rook rook e1 right away painting the knight and maybe winning an extra piece it, even though they can defend with d6 you got some sacrifices that might abrew we got bishop g5 still that would be a terrible position for the black pieces so gene decided to play queen g6 which it's a reasonable move and rook e1 was played and actually by the computer but who cares Black is somewhat winning. The, the chess engine is giving Black a negative 0.6 advantage, but I wouldn't want to play this position because of how scattered the Black pieces are and how unorganized the Black pieces is too. Until you get all of these pieces developed, then I would like to play the Black pieces. <laughs> After the move rook e1, then black decided to play knight e7, knight g e7 to be exact. And after the move knight g to e7, then we got the move bishop a3 taking control of that diagonal. And if black just castles, yes, it will be a pin on the knight. And um, let me let me see right quick. What, what happens if black just castles in this moment? Nothing happens. Black could have just castled at that moment, but for some reason, um, he was scared to do so, Jing was scared to do so, and played the move b5 to cambit their own pawn so that they can get activity. But this was a massive blunder that gave white the advantage. Because after the move queen takes on b5, then black decided, you know what, I'm going to get my rook developed and my bishop developed, and we're just going to have an attacking game. I'm not just going to be on the defense while you attacked all my brothers. And so I'm going to play rook e8, attack your queen, and now your queen is going to have to move. So what happened here? Well, let's see what um, Adolf did or Anderson did. He just played queen a4, was like, okay, I'm, I'm cool. <laughs> like I don't need all these problems. It's, I'm Gucci. Like I, I don't, I don't care. Take control of the B file. I still got my bishops on this diagonal, and your king is still not castled. And so Black decided to play a move, Bishop B six, in an accuracy, but you get the understanding of it. You close down the B file for the rook. But you got this new diagonal, the G1 to A7 diagonal, and you're trying to do your own attack. Because if you look here, the bishop is attacking this F2 pawn. 
and this queen is on the G file. You know, only if we had more pieces on this king side, we could get something on this uh, king on G1 and maybe push down this H pawn. Who knows, but this bishop, hey, it might be on a good diagonal at this moment. The computer didn't like the move, but it's reasonable to think that, hey, this might be a decent way to play. Like, who, who wouldn't play bishop b6? I know the king still isn't castled yet, but now you have plans on attacking the king, so why would you castle? <laughs> White continued to develop the pieces, and knight b to d2 was played. And then after knight b to d2 was played, we got the move bishop b7, putting these bishops on this long diagonal, but the computers hated this move. And this is what happens when you get into super ultra sharp positions, and is that... If you do one move, then the computer's going to hate it and it's just going to be volatility over the board, like who's winning or not. And grandmasters love when this happens because this gives them a chance to have a, a decisive game in this position. Like this position is crazy enough where if nobody does a mistake, that would be insane. Like playing 100% um, solid moves throughout the whole game and we're already at move. 14, 15 in the Evans Gambit, yeah, this is, yeah, this is crazy. But White is winning plus 2.4, um, plus 2.4 advantage right now. And then he decided to play Knight D to E4, getting the pieces ready. And you got to look at all the checks because the checks are really dangerous. We got the Knight E, Knight D6 check, and then we got the Knight F6 check. And we got this bishop takes on F, F7 check. These can drop in at any moment, and Black gonna have to keep, um, gonna have to keep up with everything that White is doing at this moment, especially since the king isn't castled yet. And so, what happens here? After Knight E4, we got the move Queen F5 which was a massive blunder. White didn't play the exact best move in this position, but you know the principle still applies here is that this is a terrible position for the black pieces, especially since they're still not even taking this position very seriously. Even castling would have been better than the move of queen f5, even though they're both, they're both worse moves. In this position, instead of playing queen f5, they're saying either move um, d2, just sacrificing this pawn since it was already going to be taken anyway. And yes, it's really hard to play Black's position. And let's analyze this position right quick. Let's analyze it so that we're not just saying this, so that you can understand. Who's up in material? So since Black gave back the pawn, now it's just equal material. Y'all see this evaluation board? I don't, I don't want to be in front of it. Here you go. You can see it, right? The old evaluation board, the material, development, king safety, center control, space, pawn structure. Who's up in development? Clearly I am. So we're good in development as the white pieces. And I will only say that because black decides not to castle for some reason. Why don't you castle? And I don't know why people in the 1800s didn't castle that much. Maybe they was just trying to be more focused on the attack, but hey, it is what it is. If you skip chess principle, if you skip some chess principles, you're always going to get um, <laughs> you're always going to get punished for skipping chess principles. King safety clearly better at king safety since our king is actually castled. Even though their queen is on the king side, they have no firepower to attack us at this moment. The center control, we got center control too. And remember, whoever controls the center controls the game. And white is definitely controlling the game. If black is walking on eggshells throughout the position, trying to not do a bad move, that's a bad sign that nothing's going your way. In space, definitely have more space since <laughs> they was going the they're, they was going an excellent route with putting their work on b8 controlling the file, but then they blocked the file with these two bishops. And that's where everything started getting kind of scary and they didn't castle their king. And it was it was bad. So we're already up like three things, four things. <laughs> Crazy enough. And then our pawn structure, clearly our pawn structure is suffering at this moment because we have more... Um, 
we have more isolated pawns than our opponent, even though we have the same pawn islands. So yeah. Oh crap. <laughs> so yeah, we can minus that. We sacrificed our pawn structure for all four of these things right here. Those are the things that we're focusing on. Development, king safety, center control, and space. And as we take control of this position, maybe, just maybe, we can get a winning position like we already at right now. But when you're playing a real chess game, you don't have a chess engine evaluation. So you're just gonna have to guess, oh snap, am I winning in this position? And once you evaluate it, you could be like, yes I am. I, I, H1 taught me. With this evaluation in my head, I should be winning and I should be looking for tactics to get an even more clear winning position. So looking at forcing moves, capture checks, and um, capture checks and threats. <laughs> so after the move, queen f5, you know, Anderson was like, I'm just gonna take this pawn on d3, and now I'm actually threatening checks on your king because it's gonna be a discovered attack on the queen with this bishop, this bishop x-ray on the b1 to h7 diagonal. And after the move queen h5 to get out of that diagonal, the best move was just going to knight g3, but it was some weird computer move. It's not trapping the queen because the queen could still go to um, h6. It was like a positional um, move that would have kept attention. But since we're humans, he was like, I just want to attack your king and just do this check, sacrifice. Not exactly a sacrifice because once you take this knight, the only thing that's for me is this rook file and attacking your knight with this pawn and your knight cannot escape this pin on the E file. After G takes on F6 and E takes on F6, if you castle now, you got a big hole in your position. And this is what white was um, going for. White is still up a smidget of an advantage, but hey, who would want to play this position with the black pieces? I wouldn't, even though there's really no follow-up unless you do a really bad mistake. But after rook g8, taking control of the g-file, which was the correct move, you know, you can't hate Gene for whatever he's doing. Anderson played rook a d1 in inaccuracy because clear, my chess engine is telling me that this um, this balances out the whole position. It's zero, zero, zero. Who do you think is better? Which side would you pick in the comments right now? Would you pick the white side after I went over this evaluation or would you pick the black side? And you know, if black did the correct moves, maybe, maybe so you can play on um, the black side. Like if this knight moves or if this king, if this knight gets out of this pin or if this king moves to the side, maybe you can justify what you've been doing this whole time. But in this position, black made a major mistake by taking this knight on the F3 square. Wasn't the perfect knight to take, even though I get it. It's a free knight. You're threatening checkmate. How is white going to escape this? And this is the checkmate that nobody's seen coming because this move was a big blunder and after the queen took on f3 we got the sacrifice actually what is the best move in this position pause it right now so that hey you can improve while we go over these classic games from the past anytime now you know you can pause it I know how it is you just want to you just want to watch for entertainment purposes but i this channel's for teaching in commentaries and a whole bunch of crap but hey pause it right now if you're trying to get better especially if you're under a thousand rating like you should be the one pausing it more <laughs> after the queen took on f3 then we got the massive move rook takes on e7 rook takes on e7 checking the king and all of these moves is going to be forcing moves checking the king capturing something because on the next move black could take on g2 and end the game at any moment. After rook takes on e7, then we got knight takes on e7, which is another bad move, because guess what the computer was su suggesting at this moment? Guess, guess what they were suggesting? They was like, skip that, don't, don't recapture, man. 
It's, maybe I should stop throwing pieces. But anyway, don't recapture, just go King D8. That's what the computer was suggesting. But if the computer suggesting that why could just take pieces all willy nilly without any consequences, you know that there's something wrong. But after Knight takes on E7, then we got the move Queen takes on D7. What is going on here? And the best move in this position is, is no best move because if the king moves to F8, queen takes on E7 checkmate. The king had to be captured. There is no other choice. And after the king was captured on the D7 square, we got the move bishop F5, attacking the king, attacking the king with the rook, double check on the board right now. What happens if the king moves to c6? Well, we got the move bishop d7 checkmating the king on the c6 square. And who would like to be checkmated like that? So we just did this. King e8. Anderson was like, you're still playing this game? Because usually grandmasters or masters in general, I don't know what rating they was at the 1852 year, but usually grandmasters at this moment just seize a checkmate and resign. And he was like, oh, Stan, you, you're going to actually let me get this checkmate off? Bishop d7, checking the king. The king moves to f8. But if the king moved to d8, it would be the same demise because after king f8, this lonely bishop on a3 that was sitting there for a while now, and this is the second move by this bishop on a3, bishop e7, bishop capture e7, checkmating the king. The king can't move to g7 because of this pawn. The king cannot capture the bishop because of this pawn on f6 that is protecting the bishop. And the king can't move to g8 because this big rook was planning on checkmating the king on g1, but never got the chance to, and now this rook is in the way. Yes, this was just a bad position, even though all of white piece, all of black pieces were ready to attack this king on g1. It just never happened. Whoever gets to the checkmate first usually wins the game. And so, yes, this ended off with a, a pretty checkmate. I remembered seeing this checkmate on like a Mar an old Maurice Ashley program when I was a kid. If you know what that program is, put it in the comments down below. It was it was pretty good. And um, yeah, when I seen this game the first time, that this game made me fall in love with chess. Like literally, <laughs> no, not literally, but at the same time, I wanted to attack like this. And this is why I went on my, my binge, um, my binge on seeing Grandmaster games of attacking players, all right? But anyway, hey, if you want to attack like this, maybe play a gambit, but if you want to play solid positions, you can still attack like this and play solid London systems, you know, you know what I mean. But anyway, this should show you a good example of how to attack the king that is uncastled, how to get activity in the position, why it's important to castle your king, why it's important to control the center, have more space so that you can have more flexibility in the position. And then plus two, if you're going to go into a sharp position, please calculate before you do a stupid mistake like capture pieces that you have no business cap um, capturing.